Welcome. We, do, we have a new sermon series beginning today entitled Mythbusters. Now, you ever hear something and you kind of hear it and you doubt and you think, is that really true? Well, there's a lot of perpetuated myths about the Bible and about Jesus Christ that challenge our faith, frankly. And through this series, I hope that we can look at a variety of those perpetuated thoughts. And hopefully when our faith is challenged that we'll be encouraged and strengthened through the course of this series by studying those events. And kind of by, by way of get started, I thought I would uh, talk about Coca-Cola just a little bit. You know, Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola experts say that Coke tastes better in the six ounce bottles better than any other container in the world, that it's scientifically proven. It's kind of the way the carbonation mixes with the syrup. You ever hear that? And you think, is that really true? Well, I tell you what, if you don't believe that, just think about how Coca-Cola has actually influenced our culture over the past 125, 126 years. I mean, Santa Claus wears Coca-Cola red outfit. And, I, and there's people like my aunt, her kitchen, her living room, her whole house is littered with Coca-Cola paraphernalia. And you know what, when anybody wants a carbonated beverage, what do they say? They say, hey, would you give me a Coke? And what do they mean? They mean give me a diet orange crush soda, <laughs> don't they? But it's so influenced our culture and the campaign ads that they have had to advertise Coca-Cola have been off the charts, most, some of the most popular of all time. I'm going to kind of Recite those right now and see if you can fill in the blank or finish those with me. I'd like to buy. Well, you know, that's a different one. Okay, let me, let me do a little more. I'd like to buy the world. A, I want to start with that easy one, but you guys are on top of it. Max Hedron. Catch, catch, catch the... That wasn't too popular around here in Pueblo. The wave, catch the wave. Have a Coke and a... Uh, what's the other one I was thinking of? Uh, uh, Coke ads, life. Coke ads, life. That's a younger crowd here, I think. This is kind of hitting my generation. I'm feeling it. One of the most popular ads by Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola was, it's the real thing. And Coca-Cola was the real thing until their competitor started doing this challenge, this Pepsi challenge. Anybody, tell me you remember the Pepsi challenge. There's a few, yeah. And Pepsi challenge going all over the country. And, and a blind taste test, Pepsi won out over Coca-Cola nearly every time. And I'm thinking, is that true? So to kind of test that theory to see if it's true, we're going to do a taste test here today at the Oasis Christian Church in Pueblo West, Colorado. But I need a volunteer. Could I have a volunteer? Uh, I know, you know, I'm looking for somebody a little younger, maybe. A young man there with his hand up, his dad's kind of pushing him. Well, he's coming. Hey, how many Pepsi fans do we have here? If, you, if you're a Coke fan, let's hear it. Well, I think we got some Coke fans here a little bit. Now, what's your name, young man? Luke. Luke. Good to meet you, Luke. Give it up for Luke. Luke, we are glad to have you as our guinea pig today on this blind taste test. Just taste these. I just poured them out and I taste those and just tell me which one you like the best. It's as simple as that. Oh, man. It tastes pretty much the same. <laughs> I have to go with this one. Though. That one? Oh, man. You gotta be kidding me. You picked Coke. <laughs> you picked Coke. <laughs> that, that just blew my test. Luke. Really? Yes. Go sit down. Go sit down. <laughs> Hold on. Close your eyes for a minute. Close your eyes. Just, just close them just for a second. This is what happens when things get messed up. I see some people. I see some people looking. You can't look at this now. Come on. You got them closed because I want to pick another volunteer. I want to pick another one. 
I cannot believe this. We're going to edit the tape that's going on YouTube, okay? We're going to edit that tape. Okay, open your eyes. Need another volunteer. Man, you know, you are always got to be prepared to do the best two out of three. Come on up, young lady. Let's get a female up here. Somebody's got some real taste buds. I don't know what Luke's been drinking this morning. What's your name, young lady? I'm Chelsea. Chelsea, thank you for being guinea pig number two. Taste those things and uh, give it to us. And we'll have to roll after that because we're going to run out of time. <laughs> what, you're a connoisseur? She knows. That one's Coke. Okay, sit down. I just like Diet Coke, but... Um... She's right. She's right. Give it up. Um... Give it up. I didn't know that we were going to have experts. I know you didn't pick. You're going to go with that one. Pepsi, yes! Pepsi! Pepsi! Now, I think you guys drink too much Coke in Colorado. Now, you know, Pepsi did win, uh, hands down, in, take t in taste tests. And you know what? This panicked Coke. And you know what they did? They went out and did their own taste tests. And they said, we're going to create a new formula. And what did they do? What did they come up with? The new Coke. The new Coke was disastrous for Coca-Cola. It was terrible. They went down in sales. What they learned was, was Coke, the sweeter one tastes better when you sipped it just once or twice. But if you're sitting down watching the NCAA championship, you want a classic Coke when you're sitting down and drinking an entire Coke. So Pepsi wins, but what Coke found out was Coke, the original, was the real thing. Don't mess with that original formula. Now, Jesus Christ, I am asserting, is the real thing. And there's all kinds of myths surrounding that, but when Jesus walked on the face of this earth 2,000 years ago, He transformed people's lives, and He's been doing it for 2,000 years ever since. And Jesus Christ still transforms life today because Jesus is the real thing. Jesus does add life. But there's a common perpetuated myth today that says Jesus is merely one of many. One of, merely good, one of many good, good prophets. One of many good people. One of many ways to God. But on this Easter Sunday, I want to say to you that I believe that Jesus Christ resurrected from the grave and He is the only one in history to ever do that. Let's give it up for Jesus today. Yes. We're going to look at a text of Scripture from Matthew's Gospel, the very first book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in the New Testament, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, and we're going to read a story where, where Jesus Christ reassures this guy named John the Baptist that Jesus is indeed who he claims to be, and I hope the reassurance that we learned that was given to John the Baptist can reassure us when and if our faith is ever challenged. We're going to be reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, starting with verse 2. Now we're reading about John the Baptist right here. When John the Baptist heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? Are you the real thing, Jesus? Now if you've got a bulletin and you're filling that out, We've got the text, that verse printed right there. You can circle, are you the one who was to come? And the first point I want you to see is doubt's normal, even for somebody who's in the know. Doubt is normal at times. This is John the Baptist that we're reading about. John the Baptist was somebody in the know. He was the son of a high priest, a guy named Zechariah. John the Baptist had taken a Nazarite vow, being set apart holy to serve God. He grew up being faithful to God, knowing the scriptures. He lived out in the wilderness. The Bible says he dressed in camel skin, clothing. He ate wild locusts, wild honey and locusts. I mean, he was a tough guy. I mean, he was a tough guy like, like Peyton Manning <laughs> or uh, Tim Tebow. Yeah, he's a tough guy like Tim Tebow. But there's more to John the Baptist than just what's on the surface, this eccentric lifestyle. This guy was deep. He, he, he announced Jesus as being a prophet. 
And Jesus announced John the Baptist as being somebody more special than anybody else. In fact, John the Baptist was the first person to ever identify Jesus as the Messiah. And uh, Jesus, in our text today, in verse 9, you go down there, Jesus speaks here and he's quoting Malachi 3.1 and he says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So John the Baptist comes on the scene after 400 years of silence. Malachi in the Old Testament, Matthew in the New Testament, there's 400 years where God never speaks. John the Baptist comes on the scene and he proclaims that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the only way to God. In fact, another gospel it says that John the Baptist heralded this, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The only way, the only person who's ever claimed to do that. He's not just one of many. He is the one. So it's surprising to me to find out that John in this instance was doubting. Are you the one? Should we look for somebody else? But there's good reason for why he had that doubt. You see, John the Baptist was very bold in his preaching. And his preaching landed him in prison. And he began to doubt. Listen to this verse that kind of explains it. When John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he'd done, Herod added to this to them all. He locked John up in prison. John was a bold preacher. He spoke out publicly against the sin of his day, and he went, went against the leader of his land. And he preached against his adultery with his brother's wife. Now this would be like somebody today publicly, loudly voicing their disagreement with the President of the United States. If that happened, you might find that the IRS was going to audit you. You may even find that you'd find yourself in jail. People rarely like hearing about sin, especially when it's their own. And if you like hellfire and brimstone preaching, you would have liked John the Baptist unless he was pointing the finger at you. But there was no fairness doctrine. Well, there was no First Amendment right in the first century. And Herod had his own fairness doctrine. And John the Baptist was in prison for this. So here's this guy who proclaimed the way of Jesus, knew the Old Testament scriptures, had done everything right, he preached against the immorality of his day, and he finds himself locked up like a common criminal. And he's thinking, this just doesn't make sense. I'm too young to be in jail. I'm following God's way, God's law. What's going on, Jesus? Jesus, if you're the real thing, why don't you rescue me? Are you really the one, or should we look for somebody else? I don't think John the Baptist is unlike any of us. And you think about it when life seems unfair, in jail, some predicament. I mean, you, you think about it when, when you've lived... Uh, uh, a healthy life and the doctor says to you it's cancer when you've lived a dedicated life to your spouse and they divorce you and walk away if you're single and you don't see God's answer for you in a mate when you have tithed and you're still strapped financially when you're jobless and you don't see any light at the end of the tunnel and you're left to think I think in our humanity, we're all prone to doubt. And we think, Jesus, are you really the one? If you're really the one, why am I suffering like I'm suffering? Well, it's because doubt's normal. Even when your faith is solid, it'll be shaky at times. And secondly, doubt is beneficial if it motivates investigation. Galileo once said, doubt is the father of discovery. The problem with doubt is that people don't move beyond their doubt to do the investigation. Doubt can lead a person away from Christ. There was somebody who went to visit W.C. Fields in the hospital and W.C. Fields was aged and older. W.C. Fields was an agnostic. They walked in and saw W.C. Fields reading the Bible and they said, Mr. Fields, we didn't know that you believed in the Bible. He said, I don't. I'm just looking for loopholes. That's the dishonest doubter. Somebody who's really not investigating the claims of Jesus. Somebody who's just looking for loopholes. I think there is a problem in our culture today that we've begun to accept certain truths. We've heard them 
enough, but they're really myths about Jesus Christ in the Bible, that we just accept them on face value because we really do not do the investigation. Josh McDowell, in his book, Beyond, Beyond Belief to Convictions, surveyed Christian youth who grew up in the church. These are kids who were taught Scripture throughout all of their life. Now the majority of them believe that Jesus was born of a virgin and actually lived on the earth, but nearly half, nearly half of them believe that Jesus committed sins. Over half believe that he died, but he did not resurrect from the grave. 65% agreed with this statement. There's no way to tell which religion is true. They don't know if Jesus is a real thing or not. McDowell concluded this, it's not that our kids are rejecting Christianity, they've simply redefined it and they doubt the original formula and they're going back and questioning it but they're not doing the investigation to see if the claims are true or not and the results have been disastrous I believe in our culture. And we are living in a time when people never look beyond their own reason capabilities. I saw that the atheists had a convention just a few weeks ago in Washington DC and this reporter went around and interviewed all these atheists to see what they were about, see what they really believed in since they were atheists and all and this one reporter was talking to this atheist and the the reporter just kinda quipped well you know Jesus walked on water and the atheist astutely said were you there? how do you know really? well you don't have to be there to see it with your own eyes to believe that something's true, to believe that something really happened or not. But that's kind of our culture today. Uh, we're going to play a video right now in just a second. And in the video, there are two teams, and they are passing a basketball. And uh, it's about a 30 second video, and I want to see who can get this right. Maybe this will work a little better than the, the Pepsi Challenge did. But watch, focus, uh, watch the team in white and see if you can count how many times they pass the basketball, the team in white, and let's see if you get that right and then we'll, we'll stop the video. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. Okay, who got it right? All right, did anybody count 14? Okay, good. That's good. You guys are sharp. Now, how many of you guys saw the moonwalking bear walk from one side to the other? I heard somebody laugh. Now, usually 50% see that moonwalking bear. Uh, let's just play that again and uh, check that out. But did you see the moonwalking bear? <laughs> now, what you have just experienced is what is known as inattentional blindness or perceptual blindness. And it's when there's something happening out there and you just don't see it. In other words, it's easy to miss something when you're not looking for it. And uh, there is a definition for inattentional blindness and there's a portion of it that I wanted to put up on the screen. And it says this, people can falsely believe that they do not experience this phenomenon as inattentional blindness. This is due to the fact that they are unaware that they are missing things. And you know what? The same is true spiritually. If you never look for Jesus, you're never going to find Jesus. There's this unintentional blindness with that too. And that's the dishonest doubter. They never look beyond their own reasoning capabilities to research the evidence, to really investigate to see if this is really true or not. In verse 2 of our text, we, we earlier read, when John heard what Jesus was doing, he sent his disciples. 
And you can circle that. We've got that down on the bottom, that last phrase. He sent his disciples. Doubt can lead you toward Christ. This is the honest doubter. This is the person who says, is that really true? And they investigate to put forth the effort to find out whether this body of evidence could be true. Thomas in the Bible, he's known as Doubting Thomas because he said, I'm not going to believe unless I find out for myself because Jesus had already appeared to some of the other disciples and they said, Jesus is alive. He said, uh-uh. But you know what? Jesus appeared again before Thomas and Thomas saw the nail-pierced hands in his side and Jesus said, stop doubting and believe. Thomas was inquisitive enough to say, I'm going to research the evidence, and he discovered it. Now there's this preponderance of evidence out there that Jesus Christ walked on the face of this earth and people's lives have been changing ever since. There's truth that's saying that he resurrected from the grave, but we've got to be honest enough to investigate it to see if it's true for ourselves. I mean, just consider these five reasons to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These five of which most historians agree upon, even the critics who don't believe that Jesus was Messiah believe that these things actually happened. Most historians agree that Jesus of Nazareth was executed by crucifixion by the Roman authorities on the eve of the Passover. And number two, that Jesus' corpse was laid in a tomb by a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the ones who condemned Jesus, and it was a guy by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. Number three, that the tomb was found empty on the Sunday after the crucifixion by a group of Jesus followers, women including Mary Magdalene. Four, that various groups of people and individuals were visited by Jesus after his resurrection. He appeared live to them after he had died. And number five, the original disciples concluded that they believed in the resurrection even though they had every predisposition not to believe it. They themselves finally believed. And the best conclusion of those five reasons to believe in the resurrection I believe, like the early disciples did, that this information is true. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth came back from the grave, and he's the only one to ever do that. Apologist R.C. Sproul said Moses could mediate the law, Muhammad could wield the sword, Buddha could give personal counsel, Confucius could offer wise sayings, but none of these men ever arose from the grave, and none of these men have offered themselves as an atonement for the sin of the world. Simon Peter said this, Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me except, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's exclusive. That's one and the only. That's the real thing. Now, many of you, you may work with Jewish people, with Buddhists, with atheists. Even some of your family members may challenge that to say, you know what, I don't know that Jesus is the only way. I mean, why would they? When they are talking and when that happens, are you just going to nod in agreement with them and say, you know what, I know that there's many ways to God. Are you going to be able to one day stand on the conviction that you know what, Jesus is the Christ and lovingly explain that to them? And my point's this, there's so much evidence that validates the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that he's been transforming lives ever since he walked on the face of this, this earth. And anybody who investigates that is going to discover and find that truth. And intellectually it makes sense, doesn't it? You start your search and you begin to believe. John the Baptist sent his disciples. And look at Jesus' response in verse 4. Jesus said, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. You can circle that phrase that says, report to John what you hear 
and what you see. Tell John what's happening. Don't just tell John what I'm claiming to be. Jesus is saying, John, look, it's not just about the scientific and intellectual data that you can wrap your mind around. It's about the empirical data as well, that lives are being transformed. William Barclay said this, the supreme argument for Christ is not intellectual debate, but experience of his life-changing power. So doubt's normal, and doubt can be beneficial. But doubt can be allayed when belief becomes conviction. There's an important distinction between belief and conviction. Belief is just a mental assent. I believe that. I believe that it's true. This is good. But the problem in our culture today is truth has become one size does not fit all. And everybody has their own truth. And that's what we're battling. I mean, even 20 years ago, or when I was 20 years old, <laughs> when I was 20 years old, which was just a few years ago, I had friends that, that I became a Christian, and you know, we were wild, and I went back to them, and I said, look, I said, Jesus is the Christ, you gotta, and they said, Smitty, that's good for you. I believe that. I'm happy for you, but that's for you. And this is going to be the myth that we're talking about next week, that the church isn't for everybody. The church is for everybody. But they, didn't, they had their own truth back then as well. But when you develop conviction, conviction is more than belief. Conviction is, yeah, I believe it. But I tell you what, I want to stand my ground on this fact because I believe it and I don't ma it doesn't matter to me the consequences. I am going to speak up about this. When you develop that type of conviction that Jesus is the Christ, the one and only way to God, it will not only change your life, but it will change the lives of those around you. Dr. Glenn Schultz said this, At the foundation of a person's life, we will find his beliefs. These beliefs shape his values, and his values drive his actions. It's life-changing. It's experiential. And you're convicted by that. Let me tell you about Lon Miller. Lon Miller was a firefighter just a couple hours north of here. And he had such a vibrant personality that he went into schools and he talked about firefighting stuff in there. And uh, when he continued to go in these schools in the area in which he lived, there was this dynamic church there, and he kept bumping into people from the church. Nice people. And uh, it ended up that they were from LifeBridge Christian Church. And uh, this ended up being a church that Lon Miller went to do, and he'd go, he started, you know, uh, doing the fire marshal stuff, inspecting the, the school or the church. And he went in there and met the facilities manager, this guy named Gordon. And uh, over repeated times, going into the LifeBridge Christian Church, Gordon and Lon developed this friendship. And, Go and Lon didn't go to church. And Gordon would invite him, and you know, our church just wasn't for Lon. But they struck up a friendship, started going to lunch all the time, and, and uh, became good friends. And one day, Lon was going to build a fence around his backyard. And uh, Gordon got several of the people from the church to come out, and they helped Lon build that fence and they'd invite him to church and Lon, you know, Lon had a life to live. Too much going on. And now uh, church wasn't for him. Well, it wasn't long before Lon started having kids. Kids started growing up. Lon said, you know what? These kids need to be to church. What church should I go to? Well, I guess I'll go to that LifeBridge church because I know everybody that goes there. <laughs> Lon and his wife Sarah and the family started going to church. It wasn't long after that that Sarah and Lon was introduced to Christ and they saw his life-changing power. Wasn't long after that, Lon was 31 years old when he found out he had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. In October, he was running 10 miles a day. In November, he was in a wheelchair. By March, he was dead. And during the last five months of Lon's life, some guys from the church videotaped him so he could leave some stuff to his kids. And Lon wrote letters and notes to people that he knew. And the letter that I'm going to read right now was read at Lon's funeral at the end. Listen to what Lon says. Well, here we are. I'm finally home. 
It's strange to think that we enter this world, when we enter this world and when we leave it, tears are shed, tears of joy at the beginning and tears of sadness in the end. Today, most of you are struggling with the fact that I'm really gone. And I think it's okay for you to cry. The Lord knows I've cried a lot. Sarah and I have cried many nights together, as I'm sure many of you have. However, when I look at the past year and how sad it's been, I can't help but think of the 31 years of laughter that I've been blessed with. He says, when my father died, all I could remember of him was this frail, was this frail old man who had succumbed to a terrible disease. It wasn't years later that I began to remember him as a very funny, powerful man. That's the person I cho choose to remember. I hope that from this day forward, you will remember me, not as a man struggling for each breath or unable to use his legs, but for you to remember me as a person who loved his kids, saw a hero in his wife, and had more friends than should have been allowed. A lot of people look at my life and say it was too short and that it was unfair. Some even get mad and wonder why I never got mad. My answer is always the same. First, I never had time to get mad. Sad sometimes. Sad for my kids. Sad for my wife, my extended family, my friends. Sometimes just a little sad, he writes. As for fairness, well, I ask you, what's fair? Is, is fair for a mother and a father to lose a newborn baby just minutes after birth? Is it fair for a person to live to be 110 and outlive all the people who care about them? What's fair? Fair is this, he writes. God put each and every one of us here on earth to live according to His teaching and to build a relationship with Him. And when we have this relationship, when our days here on earth are over, we'll get to go home. My relationship with God wasn't perfect, but who's perfect? Fair is the fact that God gave me time on earth. How much time is up to you? Or how much time is up to Him? How you choose to use that time is up to you. Don't worry about me, I'll be alright. A few days ago I met Jesus and His Father, and I'm home now. I'm doing my best to put in a good word for some of you because God knows you need it. I love you all. I bet I miss you more than you could miss me. Well, here we are. It's time to go home. Thanks. It's been fun. Love forever and ever. Lon. You can't measure that kind of faith scientifically, but that's the life-changing power that Jesus Christ has offered for 2,000 years. Since the beginning when he walked on the face of this earth till today right now. That conviction of a dying man to say one last word to his friends. And I would say, especially those who do not know Christ. It's the same conviction that the early disciples had when they proclaimed that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the real thing. And I am convicted that Jesus is the real thing when He said, I will never leave nor forsake you. I am convicted and believe when Jesus said the truth will set you free. And I am convicted and convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right now, I'm going to... Uh, is Jordan, is Jordan here in the room? There he is, Jordan. Come up here, young man. Stand right up here. Do we have a hot mic? I brought Jordan up here today because Jordan, you are convicted that Jesus is a Christ, are you not? Yes. Amen. And he's today at 12:30. 9 years old. Yes. Jordan Bow is going to be baptized into Jesus Christ at the Comfort Inn, and he's invited anybody. Yes. If you want to come and be a part of that 12:30 at the Comfort Inn right here in Pueblo West, and uh, he's going to be baptized into Christ. And I've just brought him up here today just to to, to share that it begins early. It begins any time. That type of conviction. And I'm going to have him repeat the good confession that's been repeated for 2,000 years that Peter first gave to Christ. 
So, Jordan, would you repeat after me? I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. The Son of God. And now I take Him. Now I take Him. As my Savior. As my Savior. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? We're going to pray right now with Him. Jordan. I pray right now that the Lord lift you up in your baptism today and your step of faith to follow Christ in such a full and complete way. And I pray, dear God, as for 2,000 years people have been, been doing this, since the time that John the Baptist baptized Jesus himself, that people have been following this right to be in a position where they die to their old self and to have their sins forgiven by the only one who can forgive sins, a Jesus Christ. I pray today that many others would follow in your example and to follow in the example of countless others to this day. We pray God's blessing upon you and on us as we worship this day. And I pray, Father, that if there be one here today that's heard your message, that wants to follow in baptism, and they say, I will stand my ground, I am convicted that you are the Christ, that they would come to the comfort in today to be baptized into you. I pray that they would receive you as Lord and Savior, as the real and only thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.